Welcome to the Open Forum. Once again, we have an evening where we can spend a little time opening up the scriptures, looking at this verse and that verse in order to find a truth. Uh, and uh, you know, this is what a great, uh, this is a great privilege, a great privilege that God has put in our hands the Bible so that we're able to do this. Before we take our first call tonight, we, we received a, a rather interesting letter from Zambia back in July. We had a team that went there, and uh, it's kind of interesting, and I thought it might be an encouragement to all of us. <laughs> Dear Sir or Madam, on Monday, July 13, 2009, I happened to be in the capital city of Zambia as I was walking Along the road, I came across an elderly white lady who was busy distributing pamphlets entitled, The End of the World is Almost Here. Holy God will bring Judgment Day on May 21, 2011. I became curious and accept, accepted one of these pamphlets from her. I put it in my bag, went to the bus station, and boarded a bus back to my village, which was 50 kilometers away. And uh, uh, I, for your information, he wants to tell us, I am a very poor 50-year-old man who is HIV positive and poverty-stricken, living miserably. I get thrilled. Uh, I got thrilled, however, after reading through that pamphlet. I believe in what you are saying. It's on that pamphlet because it, you have your foolproof explanation on how you come up with that date. You quoted many Bible verses in support of what you are highlighting. I wish I had means to uh, acquire a radio receiver so that I could be tuning to the frequencies you have provided for us in Zambia. But being poor makes me... Uh, makes not it makes that impossible. However, kindly send to me the free books. I hope God will save you, save me. We are almost there, and to God be the glory. And of course, those books have, are are being sent immediately to him. I will greatly appreciate if you do so. Yours sincerely. And what an encouraging letter. You know, here's one individual, just one, that uh, gives evidence of the fact that God is really working in the world. Incidentally, that particular track, which we call the Judgment Day track, is, is available free of charge. You can call for it and pass it out to your friends and neighbors and people on the street. It won't cost you anything. Just uh, write or call Family Radio to get a supply. Uh, just to ask for the Judgment Day track. But now shall we go to our first caller on our telephone lines. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes. Uh, hello, Mr. Camping. Yes. Uh, I'm grateful that you led me to Christ, but I just wanted you to know that I'm a little disappointed in your analysis of uh, Noah and your assertion that uh, he gave the unbeliever seven days to get into the ark. I don't see any evidence at all in the Bible that he did that. And I feel that maybe you are going against your late, latest pamphlet, which says that you're, one's not supposed to twist the facts to suit their own purpose. Well, you know, the, what we have to remember is... Uh, God, uh, God, when God wrote the Bible, he didn't give us a, a lot of detail about a lot of things that were happening. But uh, he gives us a, a, the, the outline of what is happening. And first of all, he clearly declares that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Now, what does a preacher preach? And to whom does he preach? We don't have to have any doubt about that. A preacher, if he's a faithful man of God, preaches what God has given to him, and he and 
A new slight the world is going to end in seven days. My, that was that was fantastic news that he had to uh, tell forth. And who does he preach to? To anybody who he can. And just because of the nature of building a big boat on dry land, a huge craft, as crazy as all that looked, and and we also know that the animals I had to get on that ark two of every kind and and uh, that alone would be an outstandingly uh, curious sight which would have called attention uh, called the attention of a great many people and so we don't have to doubt at all that he's preaching to them look god just told me 7 days on the date of 17 uh, the second month the 17th day the flood waters will begin and I have to get the animals on the ark by that time and I'm going to be there and and why don't you come too because it's going to happen and yet there was not one person outside of his own family that showed any interest now we the very fact that later on he sends Jonah to Nineveh when he's about ready to destroy it in 40 days uh, indicates how, how God does things. He does send a preacher there to declare uh, to the populace ahead. So uh, what we're what we're uh, seeing in Noah, because he was a preacher, makes all the sense in the world. And then the very fact that he has given us uh, true believers of our day advance notice of the precise date. And why why did he give that to us? Oh, oh, oh. Uh, Not only that, but God laid down a principle that Noah would have had to follow and which Jonah certainly uh, had to follow and which we have to follow. That principle is in uh, uh, Ezekiel chapter 33. I believe it is. Let me turn to that. And there we read in Ezekiel 33 where God says uh, Son of Man in verse 2 Son of Man speak to the children of thy people and say unto them when I bring the sword against the land if the people of the land take a man of their of their coast and set him for their watchman if when he seeth the sword come up over the land he blow the trumpet and warn the people. Then whoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come, and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned. If the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, he's speaking of those who have been called to be preachers or to who are the true believers. O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Thou, therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. And you see, uh, that is why Noah, uh, we can know absolutely that he was warning the world of his day. Uh, he was a child of God and God had given him the task of building the ark, preparing for this and and seeing that the destruction was coming and therefore he had to tell it to the world of his day, just as Jonah had to be faithful. Jonah tried to escape that task, and, and God wouldn't have it. He got him, uh, he still brought him back there in order to give that warning. And this is what God is telling us today. We have no option. God has given us the timeline of history, He has given us the date. Of the, of the rapture and the beginning of the day of judgment so that we can warn the world of the horrible, horrible danger 
that is coming so rapidly upon this world. So we mustn't think for one moment that Noah did not uh, uh, preach uh, the, the, the date and the uh, information about the coming of the flood of his day. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good night, Brother Kempton. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I'm calling. Um, I'm a little curious about um, when all the true believers are raptured, which day they will be worshiping on? Because Christ used to worship on the Sabbath. So we'll, we'll all be worshiping on Sunday when we are raptured. The, we, the believers will be raptured on May 21, 2011. Uh, that is uh, the end of the salvation program for this world. Right? From that moment on, there there will be no more mercy, no more forgiveness of sin, no one else becoming saved. The only thing left is the wrath of God as he um, uh, makes this world a horrible, horrible punishment place during the day of judgment. So which day will we be worshiping on, Brother Campion? Right? Well, I, 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 it doesn't make any difference what day it is. They... Uh, we and the true believers, they worship every day. We are, as we uh, pray to God and as we listen to His Word, and you can better believe it that when when we get right up to that end, uh, that last few days, what do you think the true believers are doing? Will they be going to a ball game or whatever? I don't think so at all. I think they're going to be thinking and praying all day long. Uh, with them personally and with their families, whoever will listen, and uh, and uh, praying uh, again, oh, Father, it's almost here. Have mercy, have mercy. If any of us are are still not not prepared uh, to come into Thy kingdom, have mercy. We're so thankful that uh, it can be the very last moment that that you are saving right up until the last day. And I'm sure that as we approach the end, that is going to be heavier and heavier and more intense on our hearts uh, if we're a true believer than we could ever imagine today. We, we can't even think of how, how that is going to weigh on us when we get that close to the end. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, uh, Brother Camping? Yes. Hi, Brother Camping. My name is uh, David. I have been listening for a, a long time, and I'm very grateful uh, for your program and the fine work that you do, uh, Brother Camping. Uh, may I please ask, Brother Camping, does, does God hear all prayers? Does God hear all? Well, first of all, of course, God knows Everything that is happening, he knows what's in our minds. He knows what's what we're even going to think about before we even think it. God is uh, is God, but insofar as hearing our prayers in a uh, in a way that he uh, that uh, that uh, we're really getting his attention, or that we are that we are going to be blessed because he hears us. Uh, if 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 someone is just uh, you know uh, there's an old there's an old adage or uh, there are no uh, atheists in foxholes back in the World War One uh, the enemy uh, or the soldiers would dig foxholes and and uh, from there they would be shooting at the enemy who would be a, uh, a, a, who would be a uh, a little ways away, and they also were in foxholes, and and all those soldiers were praying, praying, praying. Oh God, I hope this won't be the day I get the bullet, uh, because it was a dangerous place to be. And so there, well, the phrase was coined: "There is are no atheists in foxholes," uh, and 
Uh, but that doesn't mean that God, even though uh, God is aware of everything that's happening, as I've already indicated, but when someone is praying uh, 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 in fear, in fear, oh God, uh, protect me now uh, that I might get out. Uh, it doesn't mean that God is listening with a view of taking that prayer seriously at all. That's God's business altogether. Because that same individual, once he got out of the foxhole and, and uh, was uh, returned to his homeland, forgot all about God. He went right back to his old life and, and didn't care uh, anything at all about God. In other words, it was a prayer of, of just fear for the moment. But, but uh, uh, when we come to God with a broken heart, now that's a different matter. The Bible says, a broken and a contrite heart, I will not despise. When we come recognizing our sin, and I keep referring to the, uh, the illustration Christ gave us in, in uh, Luke 18 of the public, and uh, he dared not look up, he smote his breast, which were actions of contrition, of really feeling... Uh, terrible the way he had been living and and begging God oh God have mercy on me I'm a sinner uh, implying that I know I deserve the wrath of God but oh God have mercy and when we come to God that way we can know he is listening and uh, we don't know whether he will save us or not because we don't know what God's plan is but we don't, we we uh, uh, we don't know whether we're one of God's elect, but there's an enormous hope that goes with that because God is a very merciful God. And it may even be, although we wouldn't know it, it may even be that God himself was drawing us and causing us to pray in that broken way. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Uh, Brother Counting, yeah. um, I have a, a Bible study I've been attending, and uh, the people there are pretty uh, hung up on uh, Ezekiel 40 through 48 um, being some literal temple to be built. And I, I know that we pretty much understand it to be a parable. Can you help me out at all with understanding? Well, uh, yeah, the, uh, the uh, Ezekiel 40, uh, the last eight chapters of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 40, 41, 42 through 48, are strictly parable language all the way through. They're describing a uh, temple that is being built uh, and uh, all the actions that are going along with it and giving a lot of dimensions of the, of the size of the temple and the size of the doorways and the size of the walls and so on. And all of that has spiritual meaning. All of that has spiritual meaning. But... I have never gone through that, and so I'm not qualified a bit to uh, help you understand that. Um, I find it very interesting that um, the, the only calendar dates that are mentioned are there with Noah's flood, which is to me pretty convincing that uh, what you're uh, coming up with, with understanding um, that there's 7,000 years between that disaster and the end of the world, because, you know, there's no other calendar dates that are mentioned in, throughout the whole book of Genesis, and so that God found it very important to uh, mention those dates very specifically, and there's no yeah. other calendar dates. I think, uh, well, it's, uh, it's, of course, God's, uh, God's wonderful blessing that years ago already we came to the understand that, the, uh, cr that uh, creation occurred in the year 11,013, Incidentally, even that was kind of curious. Uh, 11,013 uh, when coordinated with our calendar. And uh, the creation that, that year is uh, 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 very close to 11,000 years from the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the first time to demonstrate how he suffered for our sins. And 13,000 years from the date when he came uh, the final time to complete our salvation already. And, and uh, as, as the 
calendar, the uh, opening of the calendar dates of the Bible developed through the years, there were many, many uh, curious uh, uh, things like this that did develop, which which kind of gave encouragement that this this has to be accurate because otherwise it wouldn't fall into place quite like this. Although there was no uh, uh, absolute assurance that it was accurate, but at least we came to the date 4990 B.C. And then much, much, much later, we came to the date of 2011. And then after that, we learned, as we were looking at Second uh, Peter chapter 3, verse 8 again, and I, I admit I have looked at that uh, through the years many, many times and had no idea what God, what the significance of that was. And I know many times on the open forum, when I was asked about Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8, a day is a thousand years, I would give the classic theological answer that time with God is different than time with us. And, and uh, uh, we think of, a, of a, a day as 24 hours, and yet for God there's so much crammed into it, it's like a thousand years. Or again, a thousand years goes by so fast. In God's sight, it's like a day, or something of that nature, all, all which had nothing to do with the correct answer, but it was the best that we could do at the time. But finally, finally, then when it when we learned that the two dates, 4990 and 2011, were exactly 7,000 years apart, then wow, then, then that verse really came into its own. And we saw what a wonderful, wonderful proof that God has given us that our homework on developing the the timeline of history had been done very accurately. Now, now you also converge upon that day with being uh, 23 years past the day of Pentecost on uh, 1988. Um, I'm just curious how the 17th day of the second month can be... 50, it's, it's a Pentecost day, correct? Or a day before Pentecost? Because it's 23 years exactly after the end of the church age? Uh, no, the uh, 17th day of the second month is uh, not related to Pentecost. Um, uh, let me see. No, it, no, it can't be. Yeah, that's what I thought. It, it can't be because Pentecost is 40, 50 days or 49 days after the first Sabbath, after the or uh, in connection with the atonement, and it's the fi- whatever the next Sunday is, and uh, so it would be about 50 days after the 14th day of the first month, and 50 days would bring you into the third month. The 17th day in the se- of the second month is not related to Pentecost at all. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, let me turn the radio down one moment. one moment. Yes, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. What is your okay. question? Uh, my question is, um, I've been calling you once a month, and um, and I've asked you the same question, and uh, I, I feel... Not satisfied. I don't, I, I don't think I've ever gotten a satisfactory answer from you. And the question would be, and I kind of dragged it out, you know, uh, the last few times that I've called once a month, and I'm just going to be a little more direct this time. Um, my question is, uh, there are two people, one on the left, one on the right. The one on the right has become saved. Um, they have an intense desire to do the will of God and they find a very profound change has happened in their life. They trust the Bible implicitly, and they indeed are saved. Um, so my question is, 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 but the one on the left, why do you teach in some of your, like, two latest books that God can allow? Uh, this is what I seem to be reading. Why do you teach that, that the one on the left can have the same genuine, the same genuine thoughts and feelings of a saved Christian, but they are not one of God's elect because God is just simply allowing 
it could be God working in them, well, plus, their, uh, plus right. their own conscience, too. Right. Well, thank you for sharing your question. You set up a straw man, though. You have set up a situation that's not, that is not true. Uh, the, there is a vast difference between someone who has been elected to become saved and God had already made payment for his sins uh, so that he had obligated himself to eventually give that person a new resurrected soul, a new eternal soul, uh, which is, happens at the time he became saved. Uh, whereas the one who has not been elected uh, never does receive an, a, uh, a, an eternal soul. And because that person on the right has, in your illustration, has received an eternal soul, it has made a profound impact. Now, you said that both of them re are, are looking exactly alike. That's impossible. Because the one on the right has a new eternal soul in which he never wants to sin again. His whole personality has been changed, even though he still has to live in a body that still could, can lust after sin. The man on the left has not received a, an eternal soul, and so he still, even though he tries uh, to do it God's way, he tries... Uh, he, he thinks that he truly has become saved, uh, but in his soul he still lusts after sin just as he does in his body. And that makes a, a profound impact on how he lives. And, uh, and, but we can't see that with our, with our eyes. Only God can see the heart. Only God can see the intents of the mind. We can't tell. Uh, two, two men... Uh, uh, one, one who is elect and the other who is not can act, uh, as far as we see it, identically, but they're not identically at all. They're, that's not possible. Because one of them, when he has been saved, has become a new personality, an eternal personality. And the Bible says in First John chapter 3, verse 9, that which is born of God cannot sin. And the one on the right has been born of God. But I'm sorry. that, uh, 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 But that's the answer. But we have to pause for this message. We're continuing with the Open Forum. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Harold. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hey, um, the end happens exactly 2017 years after Jesus was born isn't that true 2000 no let me see Jesus was born 7 BC uh, that would be 2018 let's, yes 2017 right because there's no zero right right yes yes 2017 years and so that, that that's that doesn't surprise us. That 17 is the number signifying heaven. Christ right, was like, born like, in order to save people. And the flood happened to 17. I'm sorry? And, and Noah's flood happened to 17. To, the flood happened 2017 when? No, no. The second month and the 17th day. The second month the 17th day yes but I don't think that we to relate 2,000 years and 17 years with two second day and the 17th uh, or the second month and the 17th day um, maybe they it's relate together very, I don't know very curious proof isn't but, it? But, but it is true that <laughs> you know it is true that that now that we have that whole timeline uh, set for uh, the time when Christ came and when he was baptized and and when uh, uh, David sat on the was made king and so on, we find many many curious uh, uh, new, uh, relationships between various dates, uh, showing that all, it all has been very carefully arranged by God. Uh, we don't get the idea at all that uh, the development of the timeline of history was capricious 
or just by uh, accident or by whim or whatever. It was, uh, it, it, we constantly get the idea that it was all very carefully laid out. And so these kind of inner, inner uh, relationships uh, uh, that we have, we don't even talk about uh, uh, to make a, a, ca- a case for the end of the world at all, but yet they exist. And, and that doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah, I see it now. N- now that you did your homework, it all comes to light. Whenever I look at that, after the ark was completed, set, he was told seven days, and it was 7,000 years from the beginning, and then it says it was the second month, and the 17th day, it says it right there, 2,000 years, 17 years, yes, and I will come again. Just yes. like John the Baptist said the first time, he came to baptize with water, and the Lord will come to baptize with fire. Yes. Well, they, 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 that is not accidental, of course. That's all part of the divine arrangement that God has made. And also right. the fact, for example, that the flood came uh, 6,023 years after the, uh, after the creation, the 23 signifying destruction, and uh, that the, uh, the end of the world, 2011, is 13,000. And 23 years after uh, uh, after creation, uh, there again you get uh, a 23 signifying that destruction will occur, and that's the final act of the of the uh, the last day of the day of judgment. Right. Now, I have one more question. Yes. Um, the King James version is a very is like the superior version, and um. I'm just curious because in in the chapters of Jeremiah they they say Jeremiah, but then in the New Testament, like in Matthew two seventeen, they use the name Jeremy. Well, that's, Jer- well, but you have to remember in the Old Testament it was a Hebrew name. In the New Testament, it is the Greek uh, the Greek equivalent of that name. Okay, so what does Jeremiah mean? What is the word? Jeremiah. I, I, I'm I'm not aware of that. I don't know. Okay. Thank well, you. I, lo- I love you, Harold. It was nice talking to you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Campbell? Yes. How are you doing tonight? Very well, thank you. I'd like to go to Daniel 9, verse 1 and 2. Daniel 9, verse 1 and 2. Let's look at that. Daniel 9, <clears throat> verse 1 and 2. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of Jehovah came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Now, what is your question? Oh, it's, it's, yeah, it is a, it's a question that... All right, here's Daniel, and he's looking in the books, and obviously that's the Bible, and he's looking up numbers of the years, and that's, in other words, isn't this a perfect example of what Every child of God should be doing is looking in the Bible for these same things. Oh, I think that's a good illustration. I think that is a fitting example for us to follow, that he was deeply concerned about when God talked about 70 years and and uh, what's all the implications of that. And, and uh, Dan- Daniel had his spiritual eyes open, so he came to an understanding that at the end of 70 years, Israel would be able to go back to the uh, land of Jerusalem, and uh, that that. Uh, but of course, uh, it, it, it we have the we have the statement in the New Testament, all Scripture, and when it's talking about all Scripture, when we search the Bible, there are no exceptions. It, it's not modified. That statement, all Scriptures, is not modified anywhere where it says all Scriptures except this or except that. 
it's, it stands as all scriptures are given by inspiration of God and are profitable for doctrine and for correction and training and, and reproof and training in righteousness. And that means that every word, every word that came from the mouth of God, and that means every word in the original language of the Bible, the, uh, mainly uh, Hebrew in the Old Testament and Greek in the New, is to be understood or is to be recognized as being serious language. And we don't toss anything aside or treat it lightly, lightly or casually. We know that that too, that preposition or that article or that uh, noun or that verb, whatever it is, it is an important word and we cannot just discounted it at all. I thank God for you and Family Radio, Brother Campbell. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. How are you? Uh, Welcome to Open Forum. The number to call, incidentally, is 1-800-322-5385. one 800 322 Five three eight five, and shall we take our next call? Good evening, Mr. Camping. Yes. Galatians chapter six, verse eleven. Galatians chapter six, verse eleven. There we read Galatians chapter six. Ye see how large a letter. I have written unto you with mine own hand uh, as... Uh, uh, okay. Yes, now what is your question? Uh, it's not a question. Wouldn't that be a proof text to say that God wrote this word, the whole of the Bible, with his own hand? No, it means that he was getting the information from God and he was he didn't have a secretary. When we go to Jeremiah 36 where God gives us an outstanding illustration of how he wrote the Bible. Uh, he gave the, uh, the words to Jeremiah, who in turn gave them to Baruch. And Baruch, his secretary, or is probably what he was, uh, wrote them in the role of the book, that is, in the Bi what became the Bible. Here uh, in Galatians, Paul is saying, that I I wrote the words, uh, and but he's not just saying where the words came from. The rest of the Bible tells us where the words came from. They came from God. They're not his words. They're from God. Correct. And I, I'm just saying because it is a spiritual book, and that God would, could even say to us that he wrote this with his own hand. But other than that, please go to First Timothy chapter 4, verses 13 through 16, please. First Timothy 4. First Timothy 4. Verse 13. There we read, uh, Till I come, I give attendance to reading to exhortation to doctrine neglect not the gift that is in thee which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on the hands of the presbytery meditate upon these things give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine continue in them for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear them now what is your question uh, what, what, could this this also be a declaration to see that that the Lord Jesus Christ is telling us what to do till He comes in verse thir in verse thirteen, and then proceeding on down and and as, as He says, neglecting not the gift that is in thee, and the gift that is in thee is eternal life, Jesus Christ abiding in us, and that going on to say that. As he is, as as the mystery of the gospel is Christ in you, the hope of glory, and that going along with also in the scriptures 
as he says in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 20. Would you also read that, please? Well, the fact these verses do give us, uh, tell us how we are to live. He's talking in an immediate context. Uh, God is giving instruction to a young preacher. Uh, be, uh, neglect not the gift that was the that was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Uh, that had to do with becoming a pastor in the congregation. But yeah, the but fact, wait, the but, principle, but, but, excuse Mr. me, Mr. Camping? excuse Mr. me, excuse me, the principle still is here that uh, that this gives us uh, uh, lots of information how we are to live. But you notice it says neglect uh, not the gift that it's in, uh, nor uh, meditate upon these. Uh, no, let me begin with verse 13. Uh, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. And, uh, you know, all Scripture is given um, uh, for for doctrine. We're, we're, we keep studying the Bible. We keep uh, learning, checking what we hear uh, for what others have learned to make sure that they are telling us uh, correctly what the Bible is teaching and uh, that uh, the, uh, because we love the Lord the Bible is number one in our life I mean number one uh, ahead of any other reading material and uh, uh, because we know that every time we are reading it is God speaking to us and n nothing could be more important than that and so these are helpful statements that, uh, uh, again, if you really want to get some more encouragement, read Psalm 119, where it talks about the, the law of God and how we meditate upon it and how we praise Him for it and so on. So on. Okay. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Camping? Yeah. Oh, good evening. Uh, yeah. I have a question. Um, after the rapture, am I going to know if, I'm, if I was raptured? Uh, after the rapture, will I know? Uh -huh. if, if I was after... Well, you know, at the moment of the rapture, if we are raptured, we are with Christ forevermore. And uh, we're, uh, we're in... We are in glory that is just absolutely, uh, utterly outstanding, something that we've never, never uh, uh, can anticipate how glorious it will be. Uh, if we are, uh, after the rapture occurs and we weren't raptured and we're left behind, we will know full well that we're in the day of judgment and that the end is that we're going to be destroyed and and re be remembered no more. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank yeah. you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping? Yes. Hi, uh, yes. Uh, I'm a first-time caller, and I'm calling about um, two of the concepts that were expressed earlier on by, one of your, by two of your callers. One was the concept of um, the uh, ending chapters of Ezekiel, I'm sorry, what is your question? I'm not able to hear you very well. Okay. I'm calling about two of the questions that were posed before by two of your callers. One was about the ending chapters of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter uh, 40 through, let's say, 48. Oh, of Ezekiel, 40 to 48, yes. Now, what is your question? Well, actually, 47. Um, in Ezekiel chapter 47, it talks about the living waters and the outlay of the land for the Israelis. Chapter 47, verses 21 through 23. Can you read those? Ezekiel 47. Yeah, right, let's look at that 21. a moment. Ezekiel. Ezekiel 47, verse 21 to 23. Uh, there we read... And so shall so shall he divide the divide the land again, uh, unto you according to the tribes of Israel, and it shall come to pass that ye shall divide it to it by lot for an inheritance unto you, 
and to the strangers that sojourn among you, which shall beget children among you, and they shall be unto you as those who were born in the country among the children of Israel. They shall have inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. And it shall come to pass that in what tribe the stranger sojourneth, there shall he ye give him his inheritance, say, saith the Lord Jehovah. Now, what is your question? With the context of these passages, uh, these verses read, the entire ending book of Ezekiel, uh, 40 uh, through 48, you say, um, basically, it seems that the strangers, uh, those from the nations that weren't born into the seed of Israel would then be brought into Israel and be made part of Israel. What's curious about the ending chapters of Ezekiel um, 40-48 is that they tend to describe the literal building of a uh, temple. Uh, well, Jewish that's... circles. In Jewish circles, there's actually the expectation of the building yeah. of a third temple well, I'm sorry. Uh, well, what is your question? Well, these strangers in the book of Ezekiel, sorry, in the book of Exodus, chapter 12 and 13, and even in... Um, what, what is your question? Okay. How literally should we take the Bible? Because... Historically, well, well, let me show you. Let me. Uh, you, we see the word stranger. I'll tell you how God uses the word stranger very frequently in the Bible. One thing we always, uh, and I haven't worked on these chapters in Ezekiel, but I wouldn't doubt at all that this fits into the program somehow, although I'm not qualified to, uh, to develop that accurately. But I can tell you how God uses the word stranger. Uh, as, and this illustrates this illustrates how the Bible does a lot uh, does a lot of things in the Bible. Again and again, you will find uh, three words uh, uh, quite frequently connected together, although sometimes separate. Uh, one word is widow. Another is uh, orphan. Uh, or the, the fatherless, which would be an orphan. Or the other word is stranger. And when we finally learn what these words mean uh, spiritually, we know that they relate to those who are part of the human race whom God, for whom God had already made payment for their sins before he ever created the world. And yet uh, they were born into this world and had not yet been made a child of God that is they had not been given their their eternal soul as yet and so they were strangers to uh, uh, to the kingdom of Satan uh, they didn't quite fit into that and they're strangers to the kingdom of God they didn't quite fit into that uh, and they also were widows they were not married to the law of God like the unsaved are and any longer uh, because they uh, they're uh, and they and yet they, they are not yet married uh, to Christ they cannot be called the bride of Christ yet they are orphans uh, because uh, they are not, uh, they are not yet uh, adopted into the family of God as we read in Romans 8 uh, but neither are they looked upon as spiritual sons that is by God looked upon as spiritual sons of, of the devil as the, un, as the other unsaved are and so we have learned that whenever we see those words these are the kind of people he's talking about now here he's talking about strangers and there are those who come into the kingdom of God continuously uh, as as uh, as uh, if they ha have had their sins paid for before the foundation of the world, these strangers can come in. Uh, only God, of course, is the one who brings them in. Now, this is one possible meaning. But I, I, like I say, I'm not qualified really to go into these verses 
in greater detail because I've never really worked on them. But thank you for calling and sharing. Uh, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to the forum. Happy birthday. I'm calling from the next testament. And I don't really have a question because I accept. Do you? I'm sorry. Yeah, you, uh, you do not have a question. I don't. I accept. I don't need the question anymore. Well, thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, Mr. Campen, this is uh, Todd. I'm Hello? sorry. Go ahead with your call. What is yeah, your I got, question? I have a question. Um, in the scripture, it says Jesus said that no man can come to me like the fire was sent me. And uh, I was just wondering, um, is it the Father actually that draws us to his word? Well, we, uh, do you see, uh, in that context, when God Christ is saying, no man can come to me, uh, he is talking about coming to salvation, and we have nothing to do with getting ourselves saved. That work is 100% the work of God and in that, from that standpoint the Father has to draw us yeah, the Father is God He is, yeah, he, he is uh, totally involved in our salvation but, uh, but we, are, we, we are not we, uh, we are, are simply waiting upon God uh, because there's nothing that we have done that we can t should tr ever try to take any credit for as helping you become saved. Well, I agree with you 100%, but I've got, like, one problem. Like, I mean, I feel like I'm being drawn to, like, family radio and to his word because I've been in his word a lot. But I've been having a problem with this sin. I keep falling into it over and over again. I keep praying for it to go away, and sometimes I lose courage and I give up. And I get out of his word, and then I'm back in it again, and I get out, and I get back in it again. And I'm just starting to wonder, as like, maybe, I am, maybe I'm not a child of God. Well, if, if, if we are, if you have a besetting sin, that's what I would go to work on. Oh, Lord, have mercy, oh, have mercy, and strengthen me so that I will uh, give me a, a, an intense hatred of that sin so that I will turn away from it because the nature of a child of God is that we do not uh, we do not give in to any sin we know that sin is we is rebellion rebellion against God we fear God and 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 fearing God means we have a hatred for sin and so while on the one hand you can feel like uh, I'm 90% there no it's not, don't trust your feelings. It is the fact that if you are truly a child of God, you will have an intense desire to do the will of God. And, and a sin, a besetting sin, is just going to uh, uh, bother you uh, in t more and more and more. And probably, if you, uh, probably God will, will give you a hand in getting rid of that sin by sending chastisement. And if you should be chastised, and I can tell you that chastisement is not a little thing. It's a big deal. Because when oh. God chastises, we know it. And you will know it, that uh, I needed that. And suddenly that sin will lose its attraction very fast. You know, the thing is, I, I feel so guilty that sometimes it's like I, I can't even get into God's Word because I feel like I don't even deserve to be in His Word because I feel so guilty. Well, but I, I, you're trying to find some kind of a reason to believe that you're a child of God. I can't give you any reason at all, because I don't know what's going on in your heart. But I do know this, that uh, if you're a child of God, we do, not, we do not put up with sin. We cry out and cry out, and we weep, and we are troubled like crazy because of sin in our life. We don't want it to continue. You know, I, I have been praying and praying. It just seems like it's not, it just doesn't go away. I, mean, I know. I remember you saying that it's good to wait on the salvation of the Lord, and I guess they shouldn't give up. Just keep on praying. I guess. When, when I, you don't have to tell me what that sin is, but you know that that sin just isn't there incidentally or accidentally. It is sin that you want. You deep in your heart. 
you believe that you cannot live without that sin because there is no sin that uh, that we have to have sin is not there's never a reason a valid reason for sin uh, but uh, but we get so betrayed by sin we're blinded by sin that we think we think that we cannot be happy unless we have access to that sin and that means that our God, we're not looking at Christ as our God we're looking at that sin we need that sin it's a very serious matter to have a besetting sin in our life but thank you for our calling we're going to have to pause for this message we're continuing with the open forum and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum welcome to open forum the number to call is 1-800-322-5385 one 322 Five three eight five, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum, Mr. Campion. When are you going to take your own advice to the Open Forum callers and repent of your pride, your obstinacy, your malicious hang up on people, and all the multitude of sins you are stacking up against yourself against the Day of Judgment? I'm sorry uh, if. I, I'm sorry that you don't. Uh, that you feel the Bible you is saying it, not me, not the churches, not anybody, but the Bible is saying that you are malicious to your callers, the strangers who are within your gates. You do not have the fragrance of Christ when you're dealing with people, and that is a, re- a matter of great importance when you violate the law and commands of God. That's going to meet you in the day of judgment. You may not be raptured. May 21st, 2011, should the Lord uh, come, and I hope he will be coming that day. Yeah, well, you know, it's this is a, not an easy job, and I'm not alibying for this, but the fact is that, uh, uh, first of all, I, there are many callers. We have to go on to the next caller because they are uh, not, it's not intelligible to our, uh, our program. That is, uh, we cannot make a, uh, a, a good discussion developing to, out of this. Number two, we have people who are who are insisting on a, an idea that is not biblical at all, and we they'd love to air it, and we can't have them air it because that isn't the nature of the program. And thirdly, I have feet of clay. <laughs> I'm not a superman. I'm just an ordinary human being. And sometimes I don't hear the caller as well as I should. I'm sorry. But I, that's a, a physical uh, handicap, and sometimes I, uh, I do get uh, maybe more impatient than I should, and and I have to ask God to forgive me for that. And so uh, I'm not a superman; I'm just an ordinary human being. And so uh, uh, I I thank you for your uh, for your uh, thoughts. But shall we go to our next caller, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, uh, I want to ask you, you know, I've been reading the Bible, I have not completed the, the uh, full reading, uh, and I have, I haven't, I have not been able to find... Uh, uh, we have a very poor connection, I'm sorry, we're going to have to go to another caller, I'm really sorry that we have to do that, but we aren't able to continue that discussion. Shall we take our next caller, please? Hello. Yes. Yep. So since they have already made a prediction that 1994 it's going to end, and now you come up with another one with 2011, and it's all based on the Bible. That's what you say, that everything is based on the Bible, and I'm I'm just referring everything to the Bible. No, and what if this doesn't come true? Do you still believe the Bible is true? You see the problem. Oh, okay. Excuse me. Now wait a minute. Let's. You are. You have never read the book 1994. Uh, the, from what you're saying, I'm sure you have not read it because there I, I, I made a prediction, but I also 
I was very careful to emphasize that it might not happen. I put a question mark after the after the heading, and I put statements in the in the book that now we have to be careful. For example, I even mentioned in the year 2011, and you're not aware of that at all. And so you're talking about something that uh, you really don't know anything about. Secondly, what I am now saying is not a prediction. It is the Word of God. God has given us so much information, way, 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 way beyond what we had when we were uh, beginning to learn something about end time dates and it, uh, the year 1994 incidentally is a very very important year in the unfolding of the end of the world the timeline of the end of the world but it is not the end of the world uh, but, uh, but uh, now God has given us all kinds of proofs that show us that our homework has been now done accurately and so you may not like that or you may not be aware of it. That's your privilege, of course. But it's, the, it's, it's a different situation. It's night and day different today than it was when the book came out in 1994. Okay, but thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, um, thank you for taking my call, Brother uh, Camping. I'm calling about a verse in Revelations, um, chapter 20, verse 8, and Revel it talks about Gog and Magog. And I was wondering if you could tell me who they are? They are the nations of the world that are ruled over by Satan. We read... Uh, when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And that began on the last day of the church age, and the first, which was coincided with the first day of the Great Tribulation, a 23-year period that precedes the day of judgment. And during that 23-year period, God installed, officially hired Satan to rule in all of the churches as well as in the world. And during that time, Satan is marshalling all of his uh, might as he is able to to try to destroy the, uh, the uh, kingdom of God once and for all. And it's called Gog and Magog there uh, to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints. Uh, they are, uh, they are, uh, uh, the first thing that Satan did was, was, uh, uh, tried to throw out all the true believers from the churches, which incidentally, uh, was, was a, a very, very, uh, wonderful thing that happened to them because the true believers, uh, shouldn't be in the churches when Satan is ruling there. But nevertheless, his intent was to destroy them, as we read in, Revelation 11, that two witnesses were killed. That is, they were silenced, and and while Satan meant it for something awful bad, it actually turned out to be something very good for them. But uh, that, but here it's just simply saying that he went out to to destroy the world, uh, destroy the the true believers, and then the we read. Uh, uh, and fire came down from, from God out of heaven and devoured them. They compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. That is language that they came finally under the judgment of God. Ju they entered into judgment day, uh, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, that means he also uh, entered into that judgment day and on the last day of that was destroyed where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night and that's through the 153 days of the judgment day to ever and ever, not for ever and ever but all the way to uh, the time when the whole world is destroyed which is the last day of the 153-day period of the Day of Judgment. Okay. Um, may I ask one other question? Yes. Um, Deuteronomy 25.3, where you talk about the 40 blows 
um, I was wondering, is, is that for each um, incident, or is that for a lifetime? For each incident, for each incident. Well, That's like not... a, a sin or, or something. No, we know it's for it's for each time. It's not uh, uh, it's it's for each time uh, uh, that someone has committed a crime, because uh, uh, we find, for example, the Apostle Paul was beaten uh, four or five times with th th uh, forty stripes, save one, thirty nine stripes, and they were all uh, different occasions. Okay. But the but the sum total of it still is that it's a very very limited punishment, as compared when we used to say, uh, used to believe as, and the church had it all wrong, all wrong. Used to say that people would be in a place called hell and be punished there forevermore, forever and ever and ever and ever. And it would never end. Uh, that that was so wrong. It was so. Un a misunderstood it was it just had no truth in it at all okay. but thank you for calling and sharing and uh, shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum hello yes oh hi brother counting uh numbers chapter 14 31 to 35 Num please numbers 14 verse 31 uh, 35 there we read but your little ones which he said, said should be a prey when I bring when will I bring in and they shall know the land which ye have despised you know let, let, let me we have to back up uh, uh, in verse 29 God is warning about impending judgment your carcasses uh, shall fall in this wilderness and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from twenty years old and upward which have murmured against me doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to give you to dwell therein save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun but your little ones which ye said should be a prey pray, them will I bring in and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years, and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness, after the number of the days in which ye search the land, even forty days each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities, even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. I, Jehovah, have said, I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me in this wilderness. They shall be consumed, and there they shall die. Now, what is your question? Uh, my question is, uh, is the day for a year and a day like a thousand years, does it have uh, the same spiritual meaning? Uh, the, uh, uh, how does the, th the thousand years uh, that is talking about the time of the church age uh, that was actually in the New Testament a period of 1955 years that began in 33 AD and went all the way to the end of the church age which was in the year 1988 AD that was not uh, uh, although it is true that the church age was typified by the wilderness sojourn and uh, the fact is that uh, very very few people throughout the church age actually did become saved there were some very outstanding para parallels that existed in the way the churches operated throughout the church age and the way Israel operated in the wilderness okay thank you thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. Yes. Hi. I just want to take a, a minute to just thank you for doing the Open Forum every night. I can't tell you how incredible I've been blessed by it. Uh, but I do have a question tonight on Job chapter 21, verses 17 to 20. Job 21, 
21. Let's look at that, Job. 21, verse 17 to 20. There we read, uh, How oft is the candle of the wicked put out, and how oft cometh their destruction upon them? God distributeth sorrows in his anger. They are as tr stubble before the wind, and as chaff that the storm carrieth away. God layeth up his iniquity for his children. He rewardeth him, and he shall know it. His eyes shall see his destruction, and he shall drink of the wrath of the Almighty. Now, what is your question? Well, particularly verse 20, uh, verse 19 and 20, where it says, uh, He shall know it, and his eyes shall see his destruction. That is what is fulfilled in the day of judgment. It is not fulfilled uh, throughout the first 13,000 years, uh, because people may... Uh, 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 think that all is well with them and we're, when they die they go to be with Christ and they simply die and they're dead and they never again have conscious existence and they are not aware, uh, uh, aware at all. Well, you can see why I was asking that question. Adult. I'm sorry? You can see why I was asking that question because I was looking at these verses and saying, well, if the wicked die and have no conscious existence, why is God saying here that his eye shall see his destruction? Yeah, well, this 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 is you see sprinkled all through the Bible. God uh, uh, introduces language that are end that is end time language. He doesn't, uh, but it's right in the middle of language that is not not end time language, mm. and we can de and we can detect that by what the language is, and and uh, God has done that all through the Bible. Uh, by the way, I be, I'm able to watch you on WFMA t WFME TV, yes. and that, again, is an incredible blessing. I thank you for that also. Well, thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yeah, I'm a... Uh... Go ahead with your call, please. Oh, hello? 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 Yes. I was listening to uh, that debate a couple of weeks ago, and then that uh, whatever White or whatever his name was saying that uh, that you said that the flood was in 4990 BC, and he said nobody knows when the flood was, but he says that you say it, and it's not you who's saying it; it's the Bible that says it, and the Bible does say that the flood was in 4990 BC. Well, now you see, the the Bible doesn't give us that number. But when we apply all of the information that the Bible gives concerning the passage of time, and God gives a lot of information about the age of this person when he died and the age of that person when he was born and, and uh, this king reigned so, for so long and so on. And that is not just idle information. That is put there for a purpose. And when we are finally able to work through it, and it's a very, very, very difficult task to do, but when we're able to do it just you know, with the proviso that we don't take any uh, shortcuts, that is, we don't make any uh, assumptions at all. We, we have to uh, let the Bible guide us all through this. Then we uh, finally we are able to develop a timeline because God has placed it there. And we can begin to put numbers uh, to the times. That's why. That's why when God says uh, in Second Peter chapter three verse eight, beloved, there's one thing I don't want you to be ignorant of. There's one thing, and that is that a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. And then we find that that identifies perfectly with the seven thousand years from the day that that uh, uh, Noah went into the ark and the floodwaters came as compared with the day of the rapture in 2011, then we see that, yes, indeed, God has given us a, a, a very great help 
in understanding the numbers of the Bible so that we're able to come to correctly to these conclusions. Because God opened my eyes to it too, so. so. All right, thank you. Bye. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome, Hello. Melvin Farr. I have a question about your date, 2011. Uh, yeah. Didn't the Aztecs say it was 2012 when their calendar ended? No, you see, the Aztec date uh, that is has nothing, 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 nothing to do with the Bible. And in fact, they are, that 2012 prediction of them, when you look at the language of that prediction, as if the archaeologists have found it, it's not talking about the end of the world at all, like the Bible is talking about the end of the world. It is simply the, a break in, in uh, getting ready for another uh, as, uh, part of of Earth's history, whatever that is going to be. But it's been a convenient place for those who are trying to discredit the May 21, 2011 to call attention to because they're saying, ah, what, uh, what, what else is new? The Aztecs say 2012, you say 2011, uh, which, uh, uh, who has it right? It could be either one. Well, uh, it's it's simply a, a convenient uh, means of, uh, uh, for those who try to discredit. Uh, but when we talk about May 21, 2011, it is by very, very, very careful study and uh, comparing Scripture with Scripture and, and uh, uh, through decades of very, very careful study. And finally, God has opened it all up because we happen to be living in the day when God is giving us a great amount of information that has never been given before uh, our day. And, uh, and then he gives us outstanding proofs that guarantee to us that we have accurately understood the Bible. And so we know that this is the way it's going to be. And people can ridicule that. They can mock at that. They can uh, they can uh, play games with that. But it's not going to change the fact that when May 21, 2011 comes, it will be the first day of the day of judgment. And it will be the day when there will be never again any grace, any mercy, any salvation, any love of God for the world. It'll all be gone because all the true believers will have been caught up to be with Christ in heaven. Is that what you're saying? I'm sorry? 20th yeah. month. You're saying 2011 is the day, but 2011 is a date. It's a century, not a day. I'm sorry. 2011 is the year. And it's a year when it ends. Excuse but me. Excuse me. The date of the rapture is May 21, 2011. No, can I say it any plainer than that? But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Oh. <laughs> oh, hi, uh, Brother Camping. Good evening. Um, I'd like you to read for me uh, Romans 7, verse um, 11, or actually... Romans 7, verse 11. There we read Romans 7, verse 11. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. That, is that the verse? Um, oh, I'm sorry. I think uh, it's uh, Romans 8, I'm sorry, verse 11. Romans 8, verse 11. For, but if the spirit of him that raised up 
Jesus from the dead dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, that is, give life to your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Now, what is your question? Is this uh, talking about the, what will happen in the day of rapture or in relation to the day of rapture? It's talking about the, the day of the rapture, that God the Holy Spirit, who is God himself, he not only gave you a new soul at the moment you became saved, but he guarantees that our salvation will be completed. It isn't complete until we have also been given our eternal spiritual bodies, which we're, everybody will receive on that last day or that day of the rapture. Is that that's what um, the Bible study is talking about, the completion of salvation? The, the, that is the when we receive our resurrected bodies, that is the completion of our, our salvation. It all began before the foundation of the world when Christ made payment for our sins. And then the next giant stride was when he saved us, which could have been when we were a little baby or when we were a, a grown person or an hour before we died. We received our eternal soul. And then there's still one thing left before our salvation is 100% complete. He still has to give us a new eternal body. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Brother Camping, and thank, thank you so much for your program. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Go ahead with your call. Uh, okay. Um, uh, has any human being ever um, lived more than a thousand years, ever? As far as we know, uh, the Bible does, uh, uh, gives us uh, the names of a number of individuals that lived to be more than 900 years. Noah lived to be 950 years. Adam lived to be 930 years. Methuselah lived to be 969 years. That is the oldest date, and we don't have a record of anybody living older than that. Here's my point, then, that, that, um, that, that coincides also with the fact that the Lord told uh, you know, Adam that in the day you eat of it, you shall die, and that it, that and then later on when the Bible says that to the Lord a day is a thousand years and a thousand years no, as it has a day. No, that day is a thousand years has nothing to do with that. But thank you. We've come to the end of our time. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you.